good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, if you really look at it, uh, applications today are the backbone of digital. Uh, and in today's session, we will uh, walk through on how to create an application-centric cloud. And how do you really look at uh, an application-centric cloud from an enterprise context? He's just going through some, yeah, okay. So about Atos, uh, we are a, a global leader in digital services. Uh, we are about uh, 12 billion euros in revenue. And uh, we have about 120,000 of our associates uh, working with clients across 73 countries, uh, providing digital services across all layers of the stack. So that's who we are. And uh, if you look at it, uh, Atos uh, and Google announced uh, a very strategic partnership, what we call as a Atos Google Enhanced Alliance, uh, just about a year back. And we are essentially focusing on, on areas of data, intelligence, cloud applications, all integrated in a common secure platform to provide digital transformation to our customers. And we have taken a very unique approach to take a, a labs approach. Uh, so we have digital and AI labs uh, all across the world, across uh, Europe and North America, to help our clients accelerate their digital transformation. And, and when you look at the Google Cloud and, and specific to how enterprises adopt the Google Cloud, uh, there are six tracks that we feel are extremely critical that help uh, enterprises scale. Uh, when they do their digital transformation. So first one is application agility. So we'll, we'll be talking a lot about it today. Uh, second one, uh, there's tremendous amount of, of ERP and cards on how do you uh, enable platforms like SAP on, on a cloud native platform on GCP. Uh, IoT is, is one of those amazing use cases where you, you really see the need for ubiquitous access across billions of devices, providing real-time performance. Uh, across, across, you know, uh, both at the edge, swarm, uh, and back at the cloud. So we're investing in a in an ecosystem of IoT solutions, uh, uh, partnering with Google to provide enterprise adoption of IoT. Uh, collaboration again, a, a great use case uh, uh, along with GCP. Uh, so Atos Unify platform is working closely with uh, Google to provide a, a seamless global collaboration to bring in a, a digital workplace. Uh, AI, uh, all the data that comes in from the applications, all the data that comes in from IoT. Uh, so we're really collaborating to bring in industry solutions uh, that connect uh, data and provides intelligence back to the decision makers. And all of it uh, secured through what we call as our secured hybrid cloud. I'll talk about it uh, in a bit. So if you look at Atos on cloud, uh, we are about uh, 15,000 people, uh, a little over 10% of our associates are, are cloud experts supporting our customers uh, globally. Uh, and we've taken a very industry-focused approach. While cloud is a, a large utility, uh, we've taken an industry-focused approach to say, what does cloud mean from a healthcare perspective? What does cloud mean from a capital market, from a trading perspective? What does it mean from a payments perspective? So we've invested uh, along with Google in, in creating industry solutions. And, and we, have, we are kind of home to the one of the world's largest hybrid cloud today. And we continue to be a, a leader in, in uh, cloud, uh, cited by leading analysts across Europe uh, and the world. And we today uh, are uh, uniquely positioned as an end-to-end provider in terms of uh, cloud solutions. And, and what do we mean by end-to-end? Uh, Atos today, uh, along with Google, is one of the very few providers that can provide the entire stack. Uh, because enterprises, if you really look at it today, have a, have a blend of legacy infrastructure. Uh, you would have some sort of a private cloud. You would have some sort of a, a public cloud that you would want to get into. So you would need a, an integrated provider that can provide that seamless experience for a, for a uh, a customer who is embarking on digital transformation, which essentially says, hey, if you are going through a journey, uh, do you have the right infrastructure that can scale? Do you have the right technology patterns that can help you uh, develop faster? And, and is that secure and is it scalable? So if you really look at it, we are powered right from a legacy uh, infrastructure stack uh, all the way to uh, private clouds, which 
Uh, we are launching along with Google, the Google Kubernetes engine on our TOS infrastructure, which is managed, uh, and public clouds, which are a managed service from us. On top of it, there is a, a seamless DevSecOps layer and a middleware. And on top of it, uh, through our cloud studios, uh, we provide digital transformation solutions, right from modernizing things that are on legacy uh, to actually refactoring applications, building cloud native applications, uh, and uh, from a cultural perspective, how do you, you know, bring in an agile uh, workplace? And all of it uh, managed through our automation platforms and bots to provide always on applications and infrastructure from a business perspective. So coming to the topic for today, uh, I think it's, it's the time uh, in, in many decades where technology is, is core to uh, the entire transformation that is around us. So if you really look at uh, uh, consumers and, and digital disruptors, we are reimagining the way that uh, uh, right from transportation to healthcare to retail uh, and whatnot, people are reimagining the experiences through technology to say, hey, how do I do something through mobile? How do I do something through omnichannel? How do I do something through a different platform or IoT? So we are seeing this, this ubiquitous access across multiple different ways in which consumers and, and digital disruptors are reimagining things. So that's a, that's a great scenario where technology can play a key role. And on the other side, if you look at it, providers like Atos and Google, we are providing an entire ecosystem that says, uh, right from your cloud infrastructure to applications, middleware, IoT, blockchain, AI, user experience, all of it is available today. And, and if you really think about it, I think we are at a, a, a crux of you know, uh, changing technologies where if you could take some of these experiences and apply some of these transformation technologies and monetize them, uh, that is digital transformation, right? It, it, it looks so easy. Uh, but unfortunately, from a large enterprise perspective, the picture looks slightly different. So I would look at it this way, where there are a lot of ideas, and, and each division wants, some division wants to go on an IoT journey, someone wants to go omnichannel, someone wants to do a real-time uh, payments platform, someone wants to do something else. So you have a lot of ideas uh, in the enterprise today, and, and I think enterprises today have as rich or better ideas than digital disruptors today. But there is something called as the legacy, which is the legacy way of thinking, legacy way of doing app dev, legacy way of your, how your technology is. So what we essentially call as this legacy burden is kind of holding back a lot of these ideas from becoming digital realities. And, and within certain groups, uh, we do see uh, certain you know, breakaway uh, groups, which essentially say, say I, I don't care about the legacy. I have a phenomenal idea. Uh, I'm an independent digital group. So you would see some untethered balloons that go away uh, and, and create a certain app or create a certain experience. But unless it's, it's all tied back as a, as a common approach, uh, you would see those balloons either popping or, or hitting the ceiling waiting for uh, a critical mass. So what we're essentially seeing is uh, this whole idea and concept of a legacy way of working and legacy as a technology is kind of slowing down and impeding the way that you know, enterprises could, could really transform. But when we talk to a lot of our customers uh, uh, in this segment, if you really look at it, uh, the way enterprises have differentiated over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, and, and some are even 100 years old, uh, is by understanding their partners, understanding their consumers on, on how they behave, and, and that is something that has made them extremely successful over the last many years. Uh, and if you really look at it, uh, that differentiation is today encoded within the legacy applications uh, and the legacy rules which are there within what is called as a legacy burden. So if you were to really look at it, what we think in, in one side of the coin as a burden uh, is also what truly has differentiated uh, the enterprise today and what's made them win in the marketplace today. So we really looked at it to say, hey, how do we bring best of both together? You have a beautiful cloud and, and all those technologies on one side, and you have a wealth of information hidden within what is called as a legacy burden. How do you bring both so that the enterprise can you know, truly get into what we call as digital liftoff? So we really looked at it to say, instead of uh, multiple ideas trying to float off and, and try to uh, do something while, while hampered by this legacy, 
So we really looked at it to say, first thing, uh, if you really look at the legacy as knowledge, then you can really convert what is the, the dead weight that is there uh, into an equivalent of a booster rocket that can actually propel uh, an enterprise into where they need to go. And second is, is key part of it is automation, and, and we'll talk about it uh, in a while, on how the whole idea of automation can be a bridge between uh, legacy, because end of the day, uh, most of banks are 60, 70, 80% on, on legacy infrastructure and applications today. And, and it's not going to go away tomorrow. We can wish it away, but it's not going to happen. So we're really looking at how do you leverage automation as a bridge between uh, that legacy world and the new world. So it, automation truly becomes a backbone uh, in, in bringing a unified experience between the two worlds. And the last is agile on how can the payload uh, really keep, keep track of how the business is changing and then go where the business needs to go. So we're seeing this combination of how could you convert uh, what was your business rules and knowledge hidden within your legacy burden as, as a true knowledge uh, input to the future, automation to bridge gap between the old and new worlds, and an agile way of working on, on the new age platforms to increase velocity of how uh, you would deliver. And, and if you were to really look at it, uh, what's stopping them, right? What's stopping us from uh, really looking at uh, applications and, and knowledge stores which are there today in legacy and converting them into agile-ready applications? So there are multiple layers, and, and we've had different theories. We started off with a 15-factor application. We had uh, then you know 12-factor and multiple factors. So we said, let's call it X-factor because uh, we are competing with each other to create uh, n number of factors that are really required to make an application scalable and available. So bottom most, if you look at it, uh, if you remove the infrastructure dependency, you make your application really portable. So you can put it on any cloud. So that's the first step of where you could uh, literally move it to Google Cloud. Then if you look at it to say, uh, will it really scale? Will it really seamlessly work Will the business as the business grows, will your, will your underlying apps and infrastructure grow? So which is where we really are looking at a, a really decoupled architecture. How good are your uh, contracts between your services? Are they consumer-driven contracts? Or are they rigid contracts? And how can they be decoupled? And top of it are, again, proprietary frameworks. That over different points of time, enterprises have uh, invested into different proprietary frameworks. How could you really get off those proprietary frameworks uh, into a stateless architecture uh, is the next level of maturity. Uh, on top of it, I think two areas, I think telemetry and resiliency go hand in hand on can you really measure on how your application is performing. And if you can measure how your application is performing based on the different business needs, can you then architect it from a resiliency perspective of talking to your PaaS, scaling up and down. And, and if you really look at it, it's all interconnected from bottom to top. Unless you have one stack of it, the other stack doesn't work well. And, and, and very top of it comes the deployment architecture, which essentially says, can you really isolate a certain business change, and can you deploy that? And, and uh, we have had even customers where it takes two days to deploy a single application, and, and that might not be a very unique situation. Uh, but there do exist. So while you would do Agile, you would do DevOps, you do a lot of things, but the DevOps train takes two days to build, deploy, test, roll back, uh, and go on. So the deployment architecture becomes critical to isolate business functions uh, and ensure that you can provide uh, that real-time deployment from a business perspective. And, and security, privacy is, is critical. So while in a legacy enterprise, we would have done all that, uh, how do you ensure that you can actually port it uh, into the cloud as well, which becomes uh, equally secure and, and, and is regulated as it needs to be? So when do we do it, right? So it's not a point in time situation. So when an enterprise goes through, uh, there are point in time situations as well, which means you would look at maybe a couple of data centers and say, hey, this data center is, uh, estate now needs to be modernized. So we go through situations where we do a business audit and analysis of a set of applications and then say, now you would kind of make it GCP ready, you would upgrade it, you would modernize it and then go through it. So the one side of it, uh, the first two boxes are, are point in time where you really look at where you are, uh, how you would need to do an uplift and, and modernize it. And the last one is, is something as, you know, how would you integrate 
a DevSecOps lifecycle that ensures that anything that you build new uh, is that X factor compliant so that bad code and, and bad architectures don't get into uh, what we are building for the future. And so I think that's a fairly straightforward approach. I think if you look at the approach, we said simple things. We said, hey, you need to decouple, you need to re improve your architecture, you need to make it scalable, and, and you could do it uh, in a structured way. But then the complexity comes in because uh, it's not one application, it's not uh, you know, uh, one situation or one pattern. You have millions of lines of code and, and thousands of workloads across the enterprise. Uh, and, and tens of patterns. I think if you're very lucky, we will get into tens of patterns uh, versus you know, thousands of patterns that exist today. So idea is to get it to tens of patterns and, and few hundred developers who might be trying to run at the speed to essentially say, hey, how can I get uh, all of this running into uh, a new cloud native platform? So we have taken efforts to solve that issue and uh, to walk through that, I would uh, invite Pawan Trivedi, my colleague, uh, principal consultant at Atos, uh, he will walk through on, on how we've actually uh, uh, made that an automated solution. Pawan. Okay. Uh, so uh, continuing from where Ashok left out, um, as you look at the problem of cloud migration, um, there are really three problems we are trying to solve. Um, number one is scale. Uh, number two is complexity. And number three is flow. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, we spoke about uh, tens of developers trying to migrate maybe five, 10, 15 components at the same time. Uh, we already know that the apps are complex. Now, uh, given those two dimensions, imagine all of that thing is also changing at the same time. So what uh, the way we have solved this problem and we are trying to um, present it to you today uh, is based on uh, creating an automation workbench. So essentially what we would do is uh, say, can I solve these three problems and these three dimensions of migrating to a cloud, uh, be cloud ready or cloud native uh, through an automation platform, right? Um, and the sample that we have chosen today uh, is a typical uh, heavyweight to a lightweight container uh, demo application where Typically, you would have changes around the J2E spec or some configuration changes. And we'll show you how a app that can be uh, taken from an on-prem uh, environment and can automatically port it, be ported uh, to the cloud. <clears throat> so uh, the way we have solved this problem, um, and Ashok spoke about the uh, cloud life, we call it the cloud life cycle migration uh, platform. Um, a typical series of steps in doing a brownfield application uh, is starting with where is your code base sitting? What are the configuration elements that you need to do? What is the target environment, whether it is a containerized environment, whether it's an uh, absolute VM environment? What do you do with that? You take all of that, and then once you begin preparing the application environment to migrate, you design and say, look, these are the things that we need to do in order to migrate to the cloud. So it may be five things, 15 things. You may need to look at uh, you know, what the code is doing, what the configuration is doing, and so on and so forth. So what we have come up with is a very unique approach, and uh, some of the components are patented as well here, is <laughs> we run a set of uh, rules on the code base that articulate the complexity dimension that I spoke about, meaning we would have reference architectures, we would have non-functional requirements, we would have compliance toll gates. So all of those things are captured within uh, the code analyzer. And then once the code analyzer sniffs and introspects the code, it would then tell you what is the effort required in order to migrate it. And then once that is complete, you get a sense of here is the effort required to do it, and here are maybe uh, 25,000 lines of code that need to change. What we have also built as a next step is an auto-remediation framework. So not, not only we define and design what is needed to change, we also with the capability to uh, automatically remediate, remediate that code so that you can deploy it to the cloud. And once those two steps are completed, uh, we then, <coughs> 
execute the deployment routine. So we have built in adapters uh, with the GK environment, with all of Google Cloud uh, infrastructure so that once your application is changed, it can actually directly be deployed, built and deployed uh, uh, to the cloud. <clears throat> now, and the whole thing, all of these steps, all of the automated steps that I just spoke about are orchestrated by a process orchestrator. We call it the SynBots uh, PO. And I'll actually try and um, showcase some of the uh, elements of the uh, demo here. So we essentially what we start is we start with modeling the whole process in a workflow. So what we do is that from left to right, you can see the process that I spoke about in the previous slide is modeled in a formal workflow. Right from the time the code is loaded till the time an application uh, is checked out and the configuration rules are being provided up to the time the code is um, built and deployed to the cloud. Now what it does is, this is, this is again addressing the scale dimension where uh, you are looking at not just one component, you're looking at multiple components that can be deployed by multiple teams at the same time, right? So mechanism like this is very useful to standardize uh, the approach to uh, cloud in a typical enterprise. <clears throat> So the first step, now this is the first, uh, this is kind of the automation workbench we spoke about. Uh, we begin, the first step is loading the code and the configuration required uh, for you to figure out whether the application uh, is suitable to go to the cloud, right? So in this case, we go select the application and say, hey, what are the number of applications that you need to select? And in this case, we have taken a sample application uh, so the application is selected from the trunk, and the first step is to actually load the profiles, right? So profile is an interesting concept that we have created. It's a central concept within the workbench that defines uh, about, we have about 800 to 1,000 standard rules uh, that encapsulate all the 12-factor principles. Number one, um, standard cloud target principles that are required. In addition to that, any uh, basic elements that you would need to do from a software engineering practice perspective. Now, typically, it's like, you know, you should not have hard-coded uh, IPs, you shouldn't have file readers, you shouldn't have in-memory cache, and those things like that. So some of the samples are already there, and then once uh, the profile is loaded, you can already see, uh, I have, uh, you know, the good example that we always see is the FTP, for example, right? So this is an example of a rule, and there are about 800 rules uh, that the platform will introspect your code with. And once we run it through, uh, we can select and configure each of the rules and reduce the priority of each of the rules that you want to apply. So for example, if it's a client-facing compliance application, the intensity and the severity of the rules can be increased. If it's an internal application, you can obviously uh, reduce it. <clears throat> Now, the second step is actually selecting what is the type of migration. What we have done is uh, you, we have encapsulated some patterns that are available to you. Uh, in this case, we would go ahead and select uh, WebLogic. Uh, we select what is the type of binary that is going to be used. So we go ahead and select the uh, Windows build for this one. Um, and then once we select that, the last element remaining is the configuration that is required for me to connect to uh, GKA in this case. So uh, we could then configure elements like you know, number of clusters, uh, number of nodes required, you know, service endpoints, you know, security, and all of those things are uh, present and can be configured as part of the uh, deployment script step. <clears throat> now, once the configuration is complete, uh, the next step is actually going into figuring out how all of these elements can now applied to the code base. So now this is the second element I wanted to introduce the concept of a blueprint. So as you can see, I've started executing a blueprint, um, which essentially is a mechanism where you can visualize a team of 10 to 15 people or even 300 people 
working across migrating multiple components, they can each have their own profile for an environment, you know, for production, for UAT, and so on and so forth. And uh, the blueprint also gives you an ability to work around your team constraints. So maybe you want to schedule it in the morning, maybe you want to schedule a UAT run in the afternoon. A blueprint allows you uh, to do all of those steps uh, in a very consistent manner. <clears throat> so, as you can see, the code, uh, the process of uh, scanning the code has begun. And uh, as you can see, there are about eight steps that are required uh, by the uh, tool. So this is just a log. So what you see before was the progress button, uh, making sure that it's working there. And this is the log view in which you can actually visualize and monitor all the steps that uh, are required for migration. <clears throat> Now, the remediation is the key step, so it is trying to figure out, and as, as the remediation begins, um, each element of the code base is then shown to you in a nice little you know, pie chart. So what we have seen here is the number of code violations are about 22 in this case. Yeah, so 22 violations is something that we have been presented with. Now, we have two options, whether we fix it manually or we try to do, and you can actually drill down to the file, and I've uh, picked up one file to showcase to say uh, the amount of changes required, and it actually points to the line, very specific line, and the type of rules that are being violated uh, that are required to be uh, fixed. <clears throat> now, in order to automatically remediate, there are two options. One is you check in the code, so the next run of the code check-in typically would initiate the automatic remediation of all the standard stubs that are required to fix it. So we have, so usually what we have seen is the success rate is about 80%. So 80% of the standard changes required for you to go to the cloud are already modeled in a code base and that can be given to you uh, in a standardized pattern. Right? And we also provide an option to say, no, you know what, if there's a complex change, if there is something custom you want to put in, uh, you can then make a manual change and then check in the code. So typically at the next uh, check-in, the remediation is triggered um, and it automatically goes and fixes all the code base within the application. So in this case, I've uh, initiated a checkout and the checkout actually starts the scan process. So what we're expecting here is that once the rules and the 22 violations that were listed, they go through the next step, you should be able to come to a point where there are no violations found. So, <clears throat> right, so I think it should not, okay, fine. So I think at this point of time, it is the code violation because of the, because the demo application, obviously there's the line of code is about 20,000, 20, not so huge, huge code base, but the code rules violations have been fixed and that is a signal for us to say we are good to go for the cloud deployment. <clears throat> okay, so at this point in time, we again check in the application. So understand till now, what we have done is we have prepared the application, we have configured the environment, we have run through the entire uh, set of reference architecture principles, compliance principles uh, to the code, and we have got those violations fixed so that now, we said that this particular module or an application is ready to be deployed uh, to the cloud. So we check it, check the back, uh, check the application back in, and before the code gets deployed, there are two components: the application server itself uh, and the database server get migrated. Uh, and in this case, it has shown you about five or six uh, configuration rule fixes that are done on WebLogic. Okay, so I think now it will initiate about uh, a build process that would deploy. Um, and run it directly on uh, Kubernetes. <clears throat> right, so the build is initiated now. Uh, obviously, the build engine in this case, we have chosen it to be Jenkins, but the platform has come up with adapters with most of the standard CI platforms, and you can trigger the build with any other device or any other uh, pipeline mechanism that you need to. Um, and once the build is done, typically now we should be able to uh, switch back and see the application um, in the Google console. <clears throat> yeah, there it is. So um, now from on-prem, the third concept that I wanted to introduce was the sense of adapters. The platform has built in adapters for every cloud platform, 
uh, including the containerized and the VM-based uh, deployment patterns. Um, and now the app should be deployed onto the Kubernetes environment, um, including all three layers. So in some cases, you want to just deploy a service endpoint, so that can be configured. In the case of this demo, we have gone through a cluster, the workload, and the service endpoint uh, deployment. Um, and hopefully, this should show up uh, in a bit, yes. So the bank application is there uh, at the workload level. And then the last step remaining is the service endpoints. Once the service endpoints are done, the application should be available um, you know, for a checkout. OK, so I think the uh, apps being deployed and the service endpoint is coming up. Um, all right, there it is. All right, so switching back to the uh, scan, if you see the entire process has been executed and it's a clean run, a happy workflow. Uh, now, obviously there is no happy workflow in real life, maybe it's 10 to 20%. Each one of these steps you can actually solve. Uh, there is a user-based profile and administrator that can stop each one of the step and say, uh, where is the problem? Can it be introspected? There are logs available that you can go in and stop and start every step as you want. So each one of these steps are modeled uniquely that you can control for a team or for a large uh, portfolio of applications. So once a quick smoke test is run, yes, the weekend, I mean, uh, there's a standard uh, UI screen that pops up um, and that proves at least that the service endpoint is working and uh, the application is uh, deployed. Um, so I think that essentially completes um, the deployment process. So in summary, I'll just you know, uh, summarize the entire process, starting from applying the profile of all the rules that you want to encapsulate, architecture, reference architecture principles, compliance principles, and all other enterprise principles right into a central console. Run a scan to understand what is the effort, what is the amount of change that you need to make to a system, and then once that change is uh, sized up, you can then deploy and remedy the code using our standard stubs, which typically we have seen about 70 to 80% of the changes required for um, J2A applications to go to the cloud are already built in. Um, and then the third part of it is uh, the integration with the underlying cloud providers. Uh, we have an automated mechanism where, based on a DevOps principle, it will run the entire sequence of uh, uh, CI CD tests to deploy it to the uh, GK environment. So I think um, that hopefully uh, gives you an insight into uh, our approach in terms of managing scale. Managing scale is with respect to the ability of the platform to manage the multiple blueprints. Uh, complexity, again, being managed by the amount of rules that you can articulate and uh, uh, put it as part of a central system that can be managed by the centralized architecture team, for example. And then the flow, which means I should be able to make those changes when I want, because the workflow that you saw is just one happy path, right? But the same thing is done day in and day out whilst the ultimate application is going from UAT to staging to production. So you, what we see in real life is there are like multiple runs of the same automation uh, workbench that help developers uh, to make the changes in a consistent manner. Now imagine doing all of this manually. Most of the customers that we see do all of these steps manually and then at every step they end up introducing some manual errors. So a workbench, an automated solution will help you make the same changes in a repeatable and a consistent fashion.